BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody. Today is Wednesday, another Ripper Wednesday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? First, I would like to give a big thank you to everyone who tuned in to the most recent Zodiac Monday, which featured another interview with Jeremy Berthume, who is the author of So I See You Don't Paint Houses, and he talks a lot about Richard Gajkowski as a Zodiac Killer suspect, and we went through some of the possible Zodiac Killer crimes, not only the ones that could be connected to Richard Gajkowski, but also the disappearance of Donna Lass and the Kathleen Johns abduction. Both of those crimes took place in 1970. And Jeremy and I might do an episode about Jack the Ripper in the near future, and I've also been in touch with other people who have said that they want to be guests on the show, so please stay tuned to Black Box Online Radio for some uh, new formats that will be shared on this channel. And also, you guys can visit some of the links in the description box, including the one for buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88 allows you to make a donation or contribution to help support the show, and anything that is donated to Black Box Online Radio will be put right back into things. We're talking about buying true crime books to discuss with you guys, or perhaps to um, go to the construction of a new studio for BBO War, and there are going to be a lot of developments with this channel over the course of the next 12 months, and there's even something bigger than just the standard donation. There is also the Black Box Online Radio membership, which allows you to have bonus content and bonus features, including the guide, True Crime Teaches Us to Conquer Toxic People by me, Ned DeHaan. And also, I'm going to be launching a members-only podcast where I will be discussing requested topics from you guys in the comments section. And one more time, the membership is available at buymeacoffee.com, buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxned88. Feel free to check out some of the things in the description box. Now, to get to today's episode, first I would like to begin with a quotation from Philip Sugden, who is labeled as an English historian and Jack the Ripper expert, and he is the author of two books. One of them is The Complete History of Jack the Ripper, and then The Life and Times of Jack the Ripper, and they came out in 1994 and 1996, respectively. And I would actually just like to share something that isn't perhaps the largest essay ever written, but this is a quotation from Philip Sugden. I am afraid I have no patience with the bogus ripperology that has disgraced true crime writing in recent years. The formula has unfortunately become all too familiar. First choose who you want Jack the Ripper to be. Then plunder the books, newspapers, and if the budget will stretch it, the Ripper files at the police record office for facts which can be bullied into your investigation with fantasy and a veneer of plausibility. If you can't find anything, no matter, invent it. I'm not saying that there aren't plenty of people out there, specialists and laymen, with a genuine interest in the Ripper case. Of course there are. And if it was specifically for them, and it was specifically for them that I wrote my complete history of Jack the Ripper. Now, with Philip Sugden, I think you can see what he's trying to say. Because Ken Main said something very similar about the Zodiac Killer mystery when he said, You can make anything fit. You can make any suspect fit. No matter whom you're looking at, you can choose a suspect, and then you can build a narrative around them. And some people call this cherry-picking to get a desired result. Or something else that I've talked about on the channel before, intentionally distorting the information to get a desired result. Intentionally slanting the information 
to get a desired result. And sometimes people will find strong points. And also, sometimes people will find certain aspects of a statement that don't quite make sense to them. And the bi a big difference between what a lot of these Ripperologists do and what this Jack the Ripper report is aimed to do is not exactly analyzing the facts. Instead, it's more about having an end goal in sight. Like, you've already decided, okay, this person was Jack the Ripper, therefore I'm just going to find only the facts that I need to convict my suspect, as opposed to just evaluating the material in somewhat of a more objective way, because I have openly said that the focus of Black Box Online Radio is to be a social commentary channel where, I mean, you guys, I know you guys have done this before, where you're watching a documentary, maybe you're reading a book or something, and you encounter a sentence, and then you're like, now wait a second, is that really true? And you want to know more, so then you start reading up more about it. And that's the focus of the Jack the Ripper report. But I would like to um, give a shout-out to Brock V, who wrote something into the comments section saying, Hey, Ned, could you do a video on the Jack the Ripper suspect, Jacob Levy? He is the main suspect of criminal profiler Pat Brown. She was present on one of the Jack the Ripper-related documentaries produced in the last decade, and he would also be my main suspect if I didn't know about the case in favor of Charles Cross being Jack the Ripper, which puts me down to a 50-50 situation between the two. They were both butchers who lived in the same area that geo-profiling experts believe Jack the Ripper lived in. Pat Brown also believes that Mary Kelly wasn't a Jack the Ripper victim. With Charles Cross, we have an eyewitness who saw him standing near the body of Polly Nichols, and then he later makes a suspicious statement that contradicted the other eyewitness, saying that he saw the body from the middle of the street and only approached it along with the other eyewitness. With Jacob Levy, we have a history of past criminal behavior and the, infected, the infection of syphilis that could have been used as a motive for killing prostitutes, an act of revenge. Now, I'm definitely going to respond to that, and firstly, thank you to Croc V for the comment, and there is, though, a follow-up comment where somebody wrote in, in response to Croc V, and this is from Jim Lewis saying, You are in fantasy land. There is literally no evidence whatsoever against Cross. Nothing. Nothing is in all caps with exclamation points. Now, I don't exactly know if you mean that there is nothing in favor of anything to the contrary? Like, do you mean there are no points for Charles Cross being Jack the Ripper, or there is nothing that could exonerate him and clear him, clear his name for being Jack the Ripper? Because we'll find very clearly in this episode that these terms are used interchangeably. And yes, you can build a case for Charles Cross. We're talking about Charles Lechmere Cross. And, or you can build a case against him, and I've done so in some previous episodes. But right now I would like to focus on Jacob Levy as a Jack the Ripper suspect. And, and since I've started doing Ripper Wednesday, you guys know that I've been a fan of some of the popular sites, Whitechapel Jack, JackTheRipper.org, Jack the Ripper Tour, Casebook. But I also said that I wanted to look at what other writers had to say, and I found the Saucy Jackie WordPress, which I cited in a previous episode, and I would like to go to their profile on Jacob Levy as a Jack the Ripper suspect, because out of all the pages that I read, I found that this one was very well worded, and it provided a nice introduction. Jacob Levy. He was born in Oldgate in 1856. He was a butcher by trade, and by 1888 he was living in Middlesex Street with his wife and children, which was right in the heart of Ripper territory and close to where Catherine Eddowes was murdered. Jacob Levy had a history of violence, of criminal behavior, and mental instability. In 1886, he was sentenced to 12 months in prison for stealing meat from another butcher, but was instead sent to an asylum in Stone to serve his time. It was during this time that his wife claimed that Jacob had almost ruined her business, and also added that he feels, this is her quotation, he also feels that if he is not restrained, he will do some violence to someone. He complains about hearing strange noises and cries for no reason, and feels compelled to do acts that his conscience cannot stand, and has a conscience of feeling of exaltation. She also revealed that he does not sleep at night, and wanders aimlessly for hours. All right, so, I mean, that definitely ties into some aspects of the River case, but immediately, before I read anything further... It appears to me that this guy was a schizophrenic. I mean, hearing voices or 
like the and the voices are trying to get him to commit acts of violence. If all of these details are true, he does seem like a, a schizophrenic to some capacity, maybe a paranoid schizophrenic. But as stated from the comment that was written by Crockfee, it also appears that he contracted syphilis at another point, so that may have been a deadly combination. In August of 1890, Jacob was admitted to the City of London Lunatic Asylum as an insane person. His cause of illness was listed as mania, which was noted that he had had for some time, perhaps a result of contracting syphilis, so it's right there, and he died on July 29th of 1891 from complications of that disease. Jacob Levy is an interesting suspect for a number of reasons. First off, he knew the area well, having lived his whole life in Aldgate and Whitechapel. Most of the doctors who examined the victims were of the opinion that the killer possessed at least some anatomical knowledge. Whoever Jack was, he worked fast and was in very poorly lit areas, and under these conditions he was able to remove parts of the victims, such as internal organs, usually slicing the poor women from the pelvis to the breastbone and cutting their throats deeply, echoes of how a butcher might slaughter a pig or a cow. And this is something that really people are in conflict with because a lot of people think that Jack the Ripper has to have been a doctor, but one person who is not convinced at all is me, based on the fact that there could be so many alternatives. I mean, firstly, Jacob Levy as a butcher. We also talked about Hyam Hyams, who worked in a cigar factory, and he's just handling knives a lot, or Joseph Barnett, who worked in a fish market, and he's gutting fish. There could be all types of possibilities as to why the Ripper was able to remove organs from a victim, but a butcher is going to have anatomical knowledge of other species, as stated here, pigs and cows, and as pointed out in some other episodes, various animals were slaughtered in London in 1888, including horses. That's the one thing that Randy Williams includes in his book, Sherlock Holmes and the Autumn of Terror, is that horses were also slaughtered and horse meat was sold on the street, and he has some reasons for stating that, and it gets into a bigger theory. I have two episodes about... Um, his theory here on this channel. One of them is called Jack the Ripper Suspect Louis Deem Shoots, if you'd like to hear more. But I'll get back to this post from SaucyJackie.wordpress. Being a butcher, Levy possessed both anatomical knowledge and was skilled with a knife. Also, city police were known to have strongly suspected a man who worked on the same street Levy worked on. Inspector Robert Sagar reportedly said in his memoirs, We had a good reason to suspect a man who had worked in Butcher's Row in Oldgate. We wanted... We watched him carefully. There is no doubt that this man was insane. After a time, his friends thought it was advisable to have him removed to a private asylum. After he was removed, there were no more Ripper atrocities. Levy not only worked as a butcher in Allgate, but was criminally insane and eventually moved to an asylum. Another report given by Inspector, ex-Inspector Harry Cox, shares similarities to both Cigar's account and one of the strange personality of a man in the certain street. Okay, so... um. I, as you see, that's these are all strong points for Levy being Jack the Ripper. Imagine somebody who is just a high-functioning, paranoid schizophrenic who has a certain degree of awareness of his faculties, but is also experiencing fits of mania, episodes of mania, rather, as opposed to something else. Jacob Levy was a convicted criminal who, by his wife's own admission, harbored feelings of violence. He was committed to an asylum and suffered from mania and died shortly thereafter from complications of syphilis. So not only was he mentally unbalanced with a history of petty crime, often am which is present often among serial killers, but very possibly he frequented prostitutes in Whitechapel and the Oldgate areas. Also, Robert Anderson's wife once said that the Ripper was interned in an asylum near Stone. Well, I don't really accept that. I mean... That is kind of morphing into a conspiracy theory in its own right. And lastly, there was an eyewitness of a, who gave testimony. Out of all the witnesses who may or may not have seen Jack the Ripper, two stick out in my mind as the ones to most likely have seen the murderer with his victims. I have long held the opinion before ever hearing about Jacob Levy that the two likeliest groups to have seen the Ripper were Elizabeth Long and the threesome that included Joseph Lavende and Joseph Levy. No relation. Long claimed that she saw a woman 
that she saw a woman she later identified as Annie Chapman with a man outside the house where Chapman was found brutally murdered. Annie Chapman was the second Jack the Ripper victim, and only a short time before the body was discovered. The three people saw a woman and a man by an alleyway leading to Mitre Square only ten minutes before Catherine Eddowes was found butchered, and one of the men was Lavende, who identified her clothing as similar to what he had seen the woman wearing. Now, whether these people actually saw Jack the Ripper or even saw the victims is always open to debate. Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, I would even question these witness sightings. I mean, how on earth could you say with definitive certainty that somebody you saw 10 minutes before had the same clothing when, as the person that you saw murdered? I just don't think that the human brain can do that because when they saw the person 10 minutes before... They weren't trying to remember or anything. They didn't know that the person was going to be murdered. People make mistakes all the time. The brain has an incredibly terrible capacity for memory. I mean, we mix up details all the time. I mean, I've mistaken someone. Like, you know, you see somebody 10 minutes ago, you meet them for the first time, and then you see somebody 10 minutes later, and you think it's the same person, and you make some comment to them. They're like, what? Who are you? What are you talking about? And they just had a similar appearance. And bear in mind, in both of these situations, it would have been after nightfall. So I am not convinced at all about these witness sightings. With these specific ones now, there might be um, some other things like with Israel Schwartz. Maybe you'll have some more credible um, Ripper uh, sighting testimony. But let's get back to the testimony of Elizabeth Long. Elizabeth Long described the man she saw with Andy Chapman as a little taller than the deceased. Chapman was only 5 feet tall, so we can conclude that the man was somewhere between 5 feet 1 inches tall and 5 feet 3 inches tall. Lavende, on the other hand, saw a man that with the victim, who was 5 feet 9 inches tall, or 5 foot 7 or 5 foot 8, depending on which report you read, considerably taller than Long's man. And, yes, that's, that statement was worded a little bit awkwardly, but the man he saw with the victim was 5 feet 9 inches tall. So, is the guy 5 foot 1 to 5 foot 3, or is he 5 foot 9? I said I liked this article. Absolutely, I like this article. And if anybody wants to go back and reference this information, it's available at saucyjackie.wordpress.com under the Jacob Levy page. But here's one point where I just have to challenge them. I have to challenge the author. Okay, so you have a five-foot victim. Well, and yeah, the uh, man appeared a little bit taller, so he must have been five foot one to five foot three. No, again, absolutely not. I mean, firstly... You're probably not taking into account the type of shoes that the victim would have been wearing. Yes, the victim. So the victim could have appeared taller depending on the type of shoes. And also, men in the in in the year 1888 frequently wore hats. You want to pull up most of these um, photos of Ripper suspects. You'll find them wearing a hat of some kind. And that can also alter somebody's perception of the height. That could even mean, mean that the guy was shorter than five foot one, which wouldn't have been impossible in those days. And also, I mean, the guy could have been taller, he could have been shorter. Just to say, well, yeah, he appeared a little bit taller than a five foot woman, therefore he had to be five foot one to five foot three. No, absolutely not. I mean, that is just not enough information to make a statement with that level of certainty. The guy could have been five six, he could have been five foot seven and slouching. I mean, no, I just don't think that they have enough info to make that statement. And overall, though, I do think it's a very good post for um, Jacob Levy, because it really gets to the heart of the issue. This guy has mental illness. He has familiarity with dissections as well as dismembering and disemboweling animals. I mean, think about a butcher all these things that a butcher is going to be doing, disemboweling, pulling out intestines and such. With two of the Jack the Ripper victims, the intestines were pulled out and thrown over the shoulder. And with the murder of Mary Kelly, the intestines were pulled out and placed on a nightstand table. Terrible, terrible things. But that is what happened to these women. Now, from uh, Crockfee's first initial comment, it appears that there's a profiler who says that she believes that the murder of Mary Kelly, the final victim, was not Jack the Ripper. I go back and forth on this. As of now, I believe that there was one single killer who committed the five murders attributed to Jack the Ripper. And it appears that there was just some level of intensity with the murder of Mary Kelly. And you'd have to 
Now start building a more wild theory once you're going to say that, well, Mary Kelly wasn't actually murdered by the Ripper, it was a copycat, or that there was some conspiracy involved, or that it was just a coincidence, and there's just this high concentration of murders for the year 1888, and people are stitching the facts together. Maybe in other true crime cases you can build a case like that, but I don't believe so with Jack the Ripper. But there's actually a book that has been written about Jacob Levy as a Jack the Ripper suspect called Jacob the Ripper. Yes, not Jack the Ripper, Jacob the Ripper. And it's called Jacob the Ripper, The Case Against Jacob Levy. And when I first read that, for some reason my brain processed it as, okay, this is going to be a book that's going to clear his name as Jack the Ripper, The Case Against Jacob Levy. But I think they're trying to vilify him. No, okay, they are. They are, once you get into the description of it. And it's written by Neil and Tracy Lanson. Now, I have never met these guys, Neil and Tracy. I don't know them. I've never corresponded or communicated with them. But I don't think they're going to like me for the following reason. And as I've said very clearly after responding to some of the initial info about Jacob Levy, I do think that he's a reasonable Jack the Ripper suspect. I mean, someone who had the mental state that was absolutely going down a destructive pathway, but still had a reasonable ability of control. I mean, definitely dealing with mental issues, but also syphilis affecting his brain. But he still seemed to show a certain amount of control. And that is something that you don't find with a lot of these Ripper suspects. They're like, oh yeah, he was out of control, so they they just like, they he, he just couldn't have any awareness of his mental faculties. Well, with most of them, they didn't go into the asylum until quite a bit of time afterwards. But with somebody like Jacob Levy, it also makes sense. Partnered with the statement that his wife says that he's just kind of calmly walking around the streets of London at night, going on aimless uh, strolls, for lack of a better term, that all seems like someone who has a relative degree of awareness. As, as I said, I think he was a high-functioning paranoid schizophrenic who contracted syphilis, and maybe all of these things are just in balance at the right level when he would have been someone who could have committed the uh, Ripper murders. But let me just read this book description of Jacob the Ripper. When playing the name... <laughs> well, let me start over. Okay, off to a bad start. When playing the game of name the Ripper, many authors start with a suspect and attempt to make the f facts fit. Okay, that's exactly what Philip Sugden was talking about. Some suspects can't even be proven to have lived in London at the time of the murders. What is required is an ordinary man local to the East End, a man who suffered from mental illness and was known to prowl the streets at night. I mean, I'll give him the first point about how some suspects are not even recorded to have been in England at the time. One of them would be Michael Lostrog, who I was talking about in the most recent Jack the Ripper report. He was most likely incarcerated in France at the time, so, I mean, there are multiple suspects like this. The point that I will disagree with is, what is required is an ordinary man local to the East End who suffered from mental illness? No, absolutely not. I mean, look at all the different Jack the Ripper theories out there. What about the theory of... Stephen Knight of the Final Solution about how there's a type of royal conspiracy involved and Masonic rituals taking place. What about any theory that's involving those suspects, Sir William Gull and Walter Sickert, about how this is all a calculated reason? Okay, deranged, deranged, yes. Absolutely a deranged reason, but it's all a calculated thing, and it's not only just that there is some type of single twisted man who has mental issues. I mean, not everyone is in agreement upon that. And the next line is, A man with vast experience of wielding a knife in his place of work, who had family ties to the Wentworth model dwellings, where the only clue left by a killer ever was a bloody portion of the apron which was discovered. Oh, no, not at all. I mean, again, not everyone is in agreement with that. What about Russell Edwards' book, Naming Jack the Ripper, which talks about how he obtained DNA evidence from a shawl that was owned by Catherine Eddowes? What about these witness sightings that we've talked about? Now, uh, that might sound a little bit petty, but it says the only clue ever obtained, not the only piece of physical evidence. And there are clues that can be found in the witness descriptions, but as I said, there's the shawl, and what about um, the piece of blue envelope which ties to um, 
ties into a different aspect, which I'll discuss in a future episode. But it says, a man whose admission to the lunatic asylum coincided with the cessation of the Whitechapel murders. And that is also one of the things that they say is the, as a piece of criteria in favor of Jack the Ripper. No, not again. We do not necessarily know that the Ripper went into an asylum, and a lot of people use this as the core of their Ripper theory. I was even talking about the suspect Hyam Hyams last week, the guy that worked in the cigar factory. Yes, okay, the investigator into that one formed the theory by going through the asylum records and trying to find someone who went into an asylum after the Whitechapel murders. However, we aren't certain that that's what happened to the Ripper. It's an unsolved case. Look at the theory involving Dr. Alexander Petachenko that, okay, this was orchestrated by the Russian secret police and that the Ripper was Dr. Petachenko and he was smuggled out of England by the Russian secret service, for lack of a better term. No, they weren't called that. No, they weren't called that. I'm simplifying. And then he was sent back to, uh, well, St. Petersburg, actually. Okay, so that just means that he wasn't put into an asylum in England. And also, I mean, what about some of these other calculating theories? I talked about Randy Williams and his book, Sherlock Holmes and the Autumn of Terror, which talks all about how it was a conspiracy orchestrated by Peter Kropotkin and managed by Louis Deemschutz and carried out by other individuals such as Isaac Kosabrodsky and Samuel Friedman. Again, a calculating attempt at solving the Ripper crimes, or that the Ripper crimes were done in a way that was very methodical as opposed to one that was deranged. Now, as you see, I don't know who the Ripper was, and I'm only making the statement that not everybody was in agreement and is in agreement that it was just a single deranged individual who was a paranoid schizophrenic and had syphilis. Not everyone thinks that the Ripper behaved that way. And even if you're looking at a different suspect, such as Charles Lechmere Cross, and yes, Charles Lechmere was his name. Charles Cross was the alias. That's why I call him Charles Lechmere Cross. He was someone who definitely wouldn't have had mental issues to this level of severity. Now, if he were Jack the Ripper, yeah, he was crazy. He would have been absolutely nuts, but not to this level. There is someone who is mentally ill, and then there's someone who's mentally ill to the point where they're not aware of their mental faculties. And what about other suspects, such as Francis Thompson, who's the su subject of the book uh, Francis Thompson, The Works of Jack the Ripper by Richard Patterson, where it talks all about how he might have committed the murders while he was high on opium, or he was a drug addict, and that drugs fueled... Um, well, the neurochemistry in his brain to the point where he's committing these very vicious murders, particularly the murder of Mary Kelly, meaning that that's not his real mental state, or that's not the way that he would have acted all the time, that they could have been drug-induced killings. I mean, there are so many alternatives to all of the points that are listed on this on this um, set of, on this page here. There are all sorts of alternatives because not everyone is in agreement that there's somebody who lived in the East End who had mental issues or had some type of debilitating mental illness and that it was a single person who committed all the crimes. No, absolutely not. Now, I'll get back to the post here. A man like Jacob Levy. Jacob Levy came to the attention of researchers Neil and Tracy Lanson many years ago. Their continuing research brought new evidence to light, sifting through hundreds if not thousands of pages of information for ver from various facilities, they came across new undiscovered facts that strengthened their theory and helped piece together the life of Jacob Levy, including the startling fact that their suspect was first a first cousin of Joseph Hyam Levy, the witness at Mitre Square. So I take back that point about no relation, excuse me. And but uh, but also also this is not Hyam Hyams. This is just a guy with a similar name. Okay, and then spotted a Mitre Square, who was later identified as a victim, Catherine Eddowes. The evening news reported that Mr. Levy is absolutely obstinate and refuses to give the slightest bit of information. He leaves one to infer that he knows something, but is afraid to go and be called on the inquest. Jack the Ripper goes to, oh, sorry, Jacob the Ripper goes to explain some of the movements of the Whitechapel murderer, the graffiti at Goulston, the actions of the police, someone shouting the name Lipsky, and ultimately what happened to the murderer. And it does seem like these people are going to make an honest attempt. I just think that they're under a certain set of assumptions.
and to be clear, excuse me for saying that um, there was no relation between Jacob Levy and Joseph Levy. I was even mostly thinking about just differentiating that they are different people. But you can see where um, Neil and Tracy are going with this by stating that this guy is going to be covering for someone and he has a reason. Okay, though. Now, that's going to conclude my comments about uh, Jacob Levy as a Jack the Ripper suspect. And if anybody wants to weigh in on the comments section down below, what do you think about this guy? And what do you think about my statement that he might have actually had some of the mental issues, but they were all in balance to the point where he had awareness of his faculties, where he could have been the Ripper, yet he wouldn't have immediately displayed all of the, well, psychotic signs like some people are completely out of their mind to the point where they can't interact and function and they won't convince anyone that they are of a sane mind other people can hide it very well and i think that jacob levy would have been able to hide his mentally deranged capacities for a rather long time before he went to the asylum that's just me I would love to know what you guys think about this. Please put your ideas in the comments section down below. And, you know, just share anything you think about this Ripper suspect. Now I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the movie Diary of a Serial Killer. I found it on Filmrise Media here on YouTube. I'm a big fan of movie channels that just put the stuff out there for free. I frequently talk to you guys about popcorn flicks as well as Movie Central, and of course the YouTube Movies channel, but um, the YouTube Movies and TV, I think it's called now, but there's also Filmrise Media, and I found this film called Diary of a Serial Killer, and it's about a serial killer who targets women in dark alleys, and he commits the crimes by knife, so immediately I thought of Jack the Ripper, and it's done in a rather different way because it's called Diary of a Serial Killer because it actually features Gary Busey playing a journalist, and he happens to witness the murder of, a ser of one of the victims committed by this serial killer, and then he just convinces him not to take his life because he says, I'm a journalist, I want to write your story, and there's this odd relationship that develops between the writer and, well, the Ripper. Yes, it's not Jack the Ripper. The killer's name in that movie was actually named Stefan. And, you know, it's maybe not the most well done in terms of production value, but it was also a very gripping and engaging film. Because, firstly, with Gary Busey, I think about him with action movies as well as comedies. And when I was a teenager, he had a show called I'm with Busey on Comedy Central, which was all about outrageousness. But I believe this film came out in 1997, and Gary Busey's just in a full-on drama. And, you know, sometimes it's more difficult to be in a drama than it is in a comedy or an action film because it's, it's, a, it's very focused on subtlety. Like, the actor really has to pro portray certain subtle aspects where he's making the character come to life. And in that respect, I think Gary Busey succeeded. And he's playing this writer named Nelson Keese, who gets um, obsessed with his work, and then he's writing about serial killers, and then people are thinking that, oh, wow, this guy's so obsessed with his work, he's going to be the serial killer. And the killer named Stefan is totally trying to play into that. And one thing that this film did well is that they showed this serial killer, who, again, commits crimes, stabbing women by knife, and he didn't look like what you'd expect a serial killer to look like, just... He absolutely had no creepy vibes about him. He just seemed like the ordinary guy that you would see in the line at Starbucks. And he had a very unusual voice where you couldn't quite tell if he was talking with an accent. I mean, sometimes it seemed like he had a very pronounced accent, and other times it didn't seem like it at all. But what this film did do well was zone in on some of the aspects that a serial killer might feel and experience. There's one scene where this journalist is interviewing the serial killer, Stefan, and he says, What do you feel when you commit the murder? And the killer says, Euphoria. And then he asks him, Do you ever feel shame? And the killer says, No, never. And then they, he asks him, How many women have you killed? And the answer was, how many women have you made love to? And then he says, do you feel anything for these women at all? And the killer says, love. I loved every one of them. And 
my interpretation of that was it's about the quotation that somebody once gave me in psychosis there is no logic and also that how many times have you heard me use the word deranged in this movie how in this movie in this podcast in this podcast how many times have you heard me use the word deranged in this podcast, how many times have you heard me say the word twisted? I just think it's that. That this fictional serial killer, with his unusual voice, had some very twisted ways of looking at it. And this was expressed very clearly in an article that I read for the last Ripper Wednesday episode about how this writer in the New York Post was saying, maybe the serial killer thought that he was doing something good by attacking women in his own twisted and deranged mind, he thought that he was doing something good. But there was an additional layer expressed in Diary of a Serial Killer. And there was a question about the origin of this serial killer's brutality and what happened first. And he said, when he was 17 years old, he was with an older woman. I believe the woman was 35. And that that was the reason why he started killing. And then, then the the journalist is asking him, well, what happened? What happened with the woman? And he just says, this interview is over. And you were led to believe that there was some type of humiliation that this person experienced, some type of sexual humiliation that led him to commit these acts of violence against women, and that it's all about domination. Money, sex, and power. Why do people commit crimes? Power is absolutely the strongest aspect of that. Because this guy wants to have power over women because he felt humiliated by a woman. As you can see, older woman must have had some type of mother issues and that he wanted to dominate the older woman so he could dominate his mother. And when he wasn't able to do it that time, he resorted to physical violence and even to murder and in Diary of a Serial Killer, there was um, some very um, graphic scenes of the stabbings. What this killer, Stefan, would do would stab the women, and then he would drag the knife upward. And I was just a little bit surprised. But if you do watch it, I haven't given everything away because it's another film that is filled with twists and turns. And things happen that you don't expect to happen. And, um, I mean, I guess I'll just leave it at that because I don't want to give everything away. But my question to you is... Do you believe that Jack the Ripper acted this way? Do you believe that Jack the Ripper had a similar experience of sexual humiliation? And my honest answer is, no, probably not. For the following reason, I think that Jack the Ripper was someone who dealt with much more intense mental issues than just being sexually humiliated by a woman and hating his mother. With Jack the Ripper, I think that there are genuine effects that went on in this person's neuropsychology. Now, I could be completely wrong, because the people that disagree with me are the ones that I've already stated. Stephen Knight, The Final Solution, as well as Randy Williams, Sherlock Holmes, and The Autumn of Terror, who say that it was a calculated conspiracy. But to the, those who actually do think that there was a type of single killer, as I do, I think that um, this is someone who dealt with some type of imbalance in their neurotransmitters, and Jacob Levy would be a very good suspect for that. And Chaim Hyams would be a very good suspect for that. And to a certain level, Aaron Kosminski, although I have to give a shout-out to Joey, wrote into the channel saying a big point against Aaron Kosminski is that he didn't like bathing or he was afraid of bathing and that how would he even get close to the women whom he's murdering, luring them to the places where they were murdered? I mean, if he was just so smelly and disgusting. But I haven't read those exact descriptions of Kosminski other than he lived in the gutter. I mean, they say that, but they also state that his fear of bathing was truly recognized after he went into the asylum. So I could be completely wrong about that, so I don't want to state anything any further than that. But with Hyam Hyams, 
They believe that he experienced neurological issues because of epileptic seizures, like he was having epileptic seizures that would have altered his brain chemistry. And as stated with Jacob Levy, it's quite possible he was a schizophrenic who had syphilis. Something like that is going on, so says me. And it's not just simply about getting revenge on women. It's about someone who is able to blend in with normal society for a little bit, and then they just have these these fits or episodes that would have led to very, very vicious acts of violence. But this is also a very good opportunity to use um, the challenge question, which do you agree with? Do you think the Ripper crimes were cold, methodical, and calculating, or do you think they were deranged, twisted, and episodic? I mean, you can put your ideas on the comment section down below, and let's remember something. This is an unsolved case. This is an unsolved set of homicides. So I will approach your comments with, with an open mind, even if other people will disagree with you. I will approach them with an open mind. And that will be all for me now. One more time, if you'd like to watch the movie, it's called Diary of a Serial Killer, available on Filmrise Media. And I think it might be on some other platforms, too. But anybody can write the show at Blackbox Online Radio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook, my personal Facebook is in the description box, and there is always BlackBoxNid88 over on Instagram, and I'll see you there. Until next time.